Good morning, dear church. This is Pastor Nipra Vega from the Tulare Seven-Day Adventist Church. I'm so happy that you are with me this morning. Uh, as we jump into the sermon, I believe God is going to speak to us about what are the things that matter the most in the last day. So I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me as we get started with our sermon. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for having us here today. Father, to hear your word, to be blessed by your word. Please, Father, glorify yourself in us as we uh, study, Lord, as we hear this message. Let it be something that resonates with our heart and lets us uh, contemplate upon what it is that you want us to do in these last days. We thank you so much, Father, and we pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, brothers, so let's open up our Bibles, our, the Word of God. And we will begin. We will be reading off, out of the book of Revelation. So let's uh, put here on the screen the sermon that we will be uh, talking about today. This is called the last battle. Uh, the last battle uh, worship. Worship. The last battle. It will be worship. Okay. So uh, have you ever noticed that children have this innate uh desire just to imitate everything that parents do for example you see this this father here mowing the lawn and what does the child want to do he wants to mow the lawn everything that i want to do uh caleb wants to do he just copies everything i do because as human beings we have this desire within ourselves to imitate everything that is around us uh, we have this desire to worship, if you will, uh, things, you know, we were created uh, to worship. So as we will study this sermon, we'll see how worship is so central uh, in the last crisis, in the last battle. So as we go through the sermon, we're going to see what um, the battle is all about in the last day. So... Uh, did you know that the word worship comes out in the Bible 195 times? You have it here in Genesis all the way to, to uh, the book of Revelation. And just looking at here, uh, what book does uh, worship come up the most in? It's in the book of Revelation. There's almost, there's almost 35 references to worship uh, in the book of Revelation. The next book to Revelation that has worship so much is the book of psalms psalms is a book about worship as well so when we would think of worship where do we think of it the most in the book of revelation even though uh we don't think about that about it like that a lot you know the book of revelation doesn't strike us as a book of worship it strikes us as a book about end times and these dreams and all these things right but indeed revelation is the book in the bible that speaks about worship uh the most and look Worship, it comes out 77 times in the New Testament. Different types of words um, that it is used, but mostly the, the word that is used about three quarters of the time for worship is, is the word proskuneo, which means to bend the knee. Okay, so that comes out in the, in the, in the Bible. We already said, right, that the book of Revelation is the book that uh, worship comes out the most. In the book of Revelation, what chapter do you think? The worship comes out the most here we see this figure right here five times worship comes out in the and the chapter chapter 13 and the next book to it you have um, Revelation chapter 19 and then Revelation chapter 14 and what's interesting is that chapter 13 is the book uh, is a chapter where you have uh, the dragon the sea beast and the land beast so where you have these uh, figures these enemies of God that's where the worship is more central in the book of Revelation and we're gonna see right now why is that and what's interesting is that um, chapter 12 uh, chapter 12 13 and 14 is a unit it's the center of the book of Revelation and that's where worship come out comes out the most so we're going to be looking at worship in the book of Revelation. So what, what chapter do you think we're going to focus on? We're going to focus on chapter 13 because that's where worship is the most important out of all the chapters in Revelation. So in the final days of Earth's history, the conflict will be whom do you worship, okay? 
uh, by looking at just the number of worship, uh, the number that worship comes up in these chapters, it tells us that the final conflict in the last days of history, you, it's going to be who you worship, okay? Uh, let's continue. The Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, there's this verse here, powerful verse, uh, that is a verse that shows us um, that acts as a springboard to chapter 13. So it's important to read it. I'm going to read the verse, and then I'm going to read here what John Pauline writes about the book of Revelation chapter 12, which would be a, a chapter that we can study. But see here, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says, And the dragon was wrought in rage with the woman and went to make war with the descendant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So, uh, Paul, John Pauline writes the following. Revelation 12 covers the entire sweep of Christian history with the glimpse of the universal war that lies behind the conflict of earth. This history is presented in four stages, beginning in the Old Testament times. That One, the period before the birth of Christ with the glimpse of Old Testament Israel represented by a woman. Uh, and the original expulsion of Satan from heaven. The birth, ascension, and enthronement of Christ with the fresh picture of the war in heaven as seen in light of the cross. Three, the history of the Christian church between two advents of Jesus with a particular focus on the persecution of the New Testament Israel, the faithful church during the Middle Ages. And four, a view of the experience of the church in the final conflict. So John Pauline, an Adventist scholar, says, Dude, look, when you look at Revelation chapter 12, that Revelation chapter 12 is basically a cosmic, um, uh, a, a cosmic uh, small picture of the, uh, uh, of the great controversy, the war between good and evil. We see here God protecting his church while the devil is trying to destroy it even before uh, the church gave birth to uh, the son, the child, uh, God. So here, uh, Revelation chapter 12. What's interesting is that when you look at the book of Revelation, there is certain verses that, that function as a springboard, that function as a setup for the next chapter. And that's exactly what Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 says. Is. Here you have the dragon waging war against the woman, which is the church, and the descendant, the leftovers, the remnant, the ones who are left over. And these have, a, a, have two characteristics. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus. So chapter 12, 13 is all about that war that is at the last uh, days between the dragon and the remnant church. Okay, so let's uh, jump into that. So we'll see that Revelation chapter 13 is all about the unholy trinity. It's all about the unholy trinity that seeks that it seeks that all the world would worship it. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to reach up the entire chapter 13. We're going to kind of isolate the main players and we're going to see how they <clears throat> they are actually robbing God out of the per prerogatives of being God. We'll see how they mimic, they copy, they deceive the world so that they can present themselves as the Trinity. Okay, so check this out. Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 through 5. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to open your Bible uh, so that we can read this book, this chapter together. Okay, so this is what the Bible is written, what is written in the Bible. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having his horn, uh, having ten horns and seven heads. On his horns were ten diadems and uh, crowns, and on his head were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his name was like those of a bear. Excuse me, a bear. And his mouth. Uh, the, of a lion and the dragon gave him power and his throne and authority I saw one of his heads as it has been slain on his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast they worshiped the dragon because they gave his authority 
uh, to the beast and they worship the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to wage war? So here we see two of the players. We have the dragon and the sea beast. And right now we're just going to focus on the dragon because the dragon has certain characteristics that reminds us of the first member of the Trinity. So here is the first member of the false Trinity, okay? So the first member of the false Trinity is the dragon. The dragon is the first member of the false Trinity. Who's dragon? The Satan. And the dragon, he mimics and copies what the father god the father does for example the dragon has its place in heaven god's dwelling place is in heaven the dragon has a throne god has a throne he gives power throne and authority to the sea beast and uh the father he gi he gives power throne and authority to christ and we'll see that the sea beast later mimics christ okay um the dragon is worshiped and so is God the Father worship. He, uh, the dragon will be destroyed forever. And God lives and reigns forever. So see, you see these parallelisms suggest an intention between the, the writer of Revelation to, um, to, to make these connections. So uh, we'll start seeing that there's these connections that are quite clear, especially as we look at this other beast. So now let's follow on with this uh, uh, sermon. Let's follow on with this chapter. Okay, chapter 13, verses 6 through 10, okay? It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue, every nation and was given to him. All who dwell on earth will worship him. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and the faith of the saints. Okay? So here you have another sea beast. And then here, what's the sea beast here, uh, what's happening here is this is describing the activities of the sea beast. It's very important to know this. In Revelation 13, when it talks about the land beast and the sea beast, it gives a description and activities. Here in the first part, um, verses through the to the five, um, actually verses one through five, we see the uh, we see a um, description of the sea beast, uh, who what he looks like, his characteristics, and then here verses six through ten through eight, uh, we see its activities. But right now, this is not so important because we're not going to really break it down Barney style into next uh, next sermon. We'll, we'll, we'll start looking and breaking down these um, who these characters are and um, we'll, we'll break them down. But so uh, right now, it's important just to notice that there is the description and then the activities. OK, so who is this sea beast? Uh, this sea beast is the second member of the false trinity. OK. The second member of the false trinity who is compared to the second member of the trinity which is jesus christ look this um false um this uh sea beast comes from uh water to begin his activity okay so jesus begins his ministry when he comes out of the water um then it, it, uh, the sea beast resembles the dragon right because it has seven heads right Seven heads and seven crowns, just like the dragon has seven heads, you know. Um, and he has crowns as well uh, in his ten horns. So the sea beast uh, resembles the dragon and Jesus Christ resembles the father. He who has seen me has seen the father, Jesus says in John chapter 14. Do you see the parallels there? Uh, uh, the sea beast has diadems. Jesus has many diadems, right? Chapter 4 of Revelation, I mean, chapter 5 and 19 also shows us that he was crowned, right? Crowned with many crowns. Um, uh, the, the sea beast has uh, 10 horns upon his head. The lamb has seven horns. Uh, the sea beast receives powers, throne, authority from the dragon. Jesus Christ receives power, a throne, uh, receives power, throne, and authority 
from the father. Um, the CB's reigns for 42 months. And Jesus Christ uh, is in on earth ministering for 42 months, three years and a half. Remember, um, 42 months is three years and a half. 42 months, right. Four months, one year. 24 months, two years. 36 months, three years. And a half a year is six months. So 36 plus six is 42 months. So this uh, CB's mimics the the um the ministry of jesus christ because he's trying to usurp the ministry of christ uh the cbs was slain right one of his heads was slain uh jesus christ was slain the cbs comes back to life jesus christ was resurrected after the cbs was comes to life he receives worship after his mortal wound has been healed Jesus Christ is worshipped as God after he resurrects. He was given universal authority over the earth after the healing of his mortal wound. Jesus was given authority. All He says, Jesus, all authority has been given to me on heaven, in heaven, and on earth after the resurrection. Uh, another way, another, uh, the CB is called, uh, it said, who is like the sea beast, right? And Jesus' uh, 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 name, pre-incarnate name, is Michael, which means who is like God. You see that parallelism? Uh, who is like the beast? Who is like God? And finally, the false trin, uh, the false second member of the false trinity, the sea beast, has a global target over all nations, tribes, tongues, and people. Um, and the son, Jesus Christ, has a mission as well. It's called the Great Commission. And his target's a global tra target as well, over all nations, tribes, tongues, and people. So what's going on here? I, are you guys seeing the pattern? The pattern is that this false trinity is trying to mimic the trinity, the true trinity of God. And we'll see to what end as we analyze a little bit more about chapter 13. But you see this parallel, right? You see this copying, right? So, uh, look, the final one, and this is our longest uh, of reading of this verse. We're going to read the rest of the verse, uh, of chapter 13, eight verses. And we're going to talk about the lamb-like beast, all right? The lamb-like beast, which is the land beast that comes out of the land. Okay, so verse 11 says, Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he who had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth, those who dwell in it, to worship the beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He caused all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on the right hand or on the forehead. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there you go. All right. This is the land beast. Now let's start to look at some parallelisms here. Okay. So the third member of the false trinity, guess who he mimics? He mimics the Holy Spirit. He's called the false prophet deceiving people the holy spirit is called the spirit of truth the spirit of prophecy who guides people to salvation so he guides people to salvation to the truth the false uh member of the trinity the false prophet leads people to uh perdition um the false uh trinity the the you know the false prophet the earth beast he is a lamb like beast so he looks like christ 
Uh, and just like the Holy Spirit it is like Christ, right? Jesus says, I will send another paraclete, right? Another one like himself. The, um, the, the earth beast exercises all authority of the sea beast. The Holy Spirit exercises all the authority of Christ. And the, uh, the uh, earth beast directs worship to the sea beast, just like the Holy Spirit directs worship to Christ. And the false prophet, the earth beast, performs great signs. And the Holy Spirit performs great signs. The false, uh, the earth beast brings fire down from heaven. And the, uh, the Holy Spirit comes in fire at the at Pentecost. The Rex worship to the sea beast, uh, we already said that, uh, gives life, bread to the beast image. Uh, the Holy Spirit gives life and bread of life, uh, applies the mark uh, of the beast on the hand or the forehead. The Holy Spirit ap applies the seal of God on our forehead. Um, so you see that? You see the parallelisms between the false prophet, the lamb beast, and the Holy Spirit? So here we see this holy unholy trinity right in chapter 13 what's going on here the purpose of the false trinity is to lead the world at all costs to defy the heavenly trinity by causing the world to worship it to worship the false trinity so you see satan he is trying to destroy the world and he can't do it on his own he's trying to destroy israel he's trying to destroy the christianity the early church right and we see that long period of chapter 12. And we'll go into that tomorrow. I mean, not tomorrow. Next uh, time that we study together, uh, we're going to go over that uh, chapter 12 as history to see the history of the church. Um, and uh, he can. He can destroy it. He can destroy the Christian church. So guess what he does? You know, the Satan is not very original. He doesn't have a creative uh, heart. He, he's a, a master mind. In, in the sense of copying and deception. So he sees what God has and he's like, you know what? I need some helpers. I'm going to bring up the sea beast and I'm going to bring up the land beast. And as a union of Trinity, then we're going to cause the whole world to worship us. Because if the world worship us, then, then that's how we will have a full dominion. So you see... Uh, Satan is not very, very creative. And plus, Satan is not doing something new. He's not doing something that he is not trying to do before. Because remember, from the beginning, Satan was aspiring to have the worship of all create of all the angels in heaven. Uh, remember that? Uh, open your Bibles with me uh, to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14, and we're going to read verses 12 uh, to, um, I think, verses 12 to 14. Uh, and that's where we will um, see the Satan's MO, okay? Satan's MO has always been to, to one worship. He has always been uh, wanting to be like God. So here, it's chapter 14 uh, of Isaiah, verses 12 to uh, 14 says this, okay? How... How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. So what's going on with Satan? He's just trying. He's just trying to get worship. He's been wanting to get worship. So at the end of time, he actually is very successful. He causes the whole world to worship him. So, but he does this by eliciting the help of soliciting the help of two other members that consist of the false trinity. Look, I want to read to you uh, something that was written by uh, one of my uh, professors in the seminary. Uh, this professor is, is Rankel Stefanovich, and he writes this lengthy 
uh, um, commentary called The Revelation of Jesus Christ. Beautiful book. I recommend it for everybody. Um, beautiful book here. The Commandment Breakers. All right. So look at what he says about the false trinity. It appears that the first four commandments of the Decalogue, in particular, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol or likeness of what is in heaven, on earth, or, or, or on the earth beneath, or in the water on the earth, in order to worship them. You shall not take the name of the Lord of your God in vain, and remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. These four first four commandments will become the test of loyalty to God in the final crisis. These four commandments concerns one relationship with God and worship. According to Revelation chapter 12 to 14, the issue in the final crisis centers on the relationship with God and proper worship. The two groups at the time of the end are identified as those who worship God versus those who worship the dragon and the beast. So at the end of time, there's two groups of people, right? Those who worship God and those who worship the beast. This explains why the sea beast end time activities are described as a well-planned attack on these four commandments. The beast demands for worship, something that is revered for God alone. It, it directs attacks on the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before I uh, mean, The raising up of image to be worshipped. And we'll see that these sea beasts throughout this history has image as they worship images as a direct violation of the second commandment. And, and the blasphemy of God attacks the third commandment. Remember, uh, this sea beast has, has a, a name written on his forehead and his blasphemy. That's in contrast to the worshipers of God who have the name of Jesus Christ <coughs> on their heads. And lastly, the demand of receiving the mark of the beast indicates a direct attack on the fourth, the Sabbath commandment. So, here, what Revelation chapter 13 is showing us is that there is a, 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 a concerted, right, a orchestrated attack against the commandments of God, uh, a, a wanting to break the commandments of God. That's why chapter 12 and chapter 14 have these two uh, sandwich hamburger buns at, at the end. Um, they, they, uh, that actually elevate the commandments of God. Like a hamburger, right? You have the top bun and then the bottom bun, and then you have everything in between, right? A juicy, fat, uh, plant-based uh, vegan burger, right? Like that's what's in between. That's what's in between my my juicy hamburgers, right? Um, in fact, that is, is making me hungry. Well, look, you have... Um, so you have the buns. Uh, Revelation tw chapter 12, verse 17 and Revelation chapter 14, and in between you have Revelation 13. So what are the buns? Here on the screen, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, we're ready, ready, right? Read it. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And then uh, chapter 14, verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So here you have... The beginning and the end, the exaltation of the keep me, uh, keeping of the commandments. But in chapter 13, you have the breakage of the commandment. You have the commandment breakers who are leading the whole world to worship the dragon, right? To replace the God of heaven, the creator. That's why the first angel's uh, message, the first angel, uh, which is a uh, message which is found in... Um, Revelation chapter 13, excuse me, Revelation chapter 14, um, verse 6 and 7. Watch, come there with me in your Bibles. Uh, Revelation chapter 14, uh, uh, verses 6 and 7 says something very interesting. Then I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to dwell who, who those who dwell in the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and spring of water. So that angel actually is directing the world to worship the creator, right? And he quotes the fourth commandment. So you have the false trinity trying to worship the dragon, right? But Revelation chapter 14 says, worship the creator. 
the one who made us, right? So that's why we shouldn't have any other gods. That's why we shouldn't make any idols. That's why we shouldn't take the name of the Lord in vain, not to speak it. No, it's when you become a Christian, you're supposed to live like a Christian because as a Christian, we're taking the name of Jesus Christ. So we can't take it in vain. And we have to work, keep the Sabbath day holy. So you see here the commandment breakers, right? They are seeking to take the whole world to break the commandments of God. So the final crisis, what is it going to be all about? The final crisis is going to be about worship. There's going to be a global deception. All the world, everybody, no matter who you are, nobody is exempt. Everybody in the world is going to be thrown into this final crisis. And this final crisis, even though it will not be able to be perceived as so, is a crisis about worship. Every single individual in this world is going to make a choice. To whom do you worship? Who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship the false trinity? Or are you going to worship the real trinity, God the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Who are you going to worship? This is about worship. And you know what's interesting? Everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we are about shows who we worship. Yeah, it either shows that we worship God, we worship ourselves, or we worship something else. Everything that we do is demonstrates who we worship, the way that we are. That's why Jesus says, um, they will know you, you are my disciples. If you love one another, okay? So people are going to know if we're Jesus' disciples, if we love one another. Why? Why would they know that? Because our reflection, what we reflect, our character, the way we speak, the things that we do are going to reflect love, right? And that reflects God because God is love, right? So everything that we do, church, is a reflection of, of whom we worship. So we have to be very careful as a church of uh, what we think, uh, what we worship, right? Let's not worship false ideas. Let's not worship conspiracy theories. Let's not worship a false understanding of last day events. Let's not worship um, a nation. Let's worship a God. Because everything that we do, whether we think or not, demonstrates who we are worship. And God forbid that any of us worship a false conception of the Bible. Because that's what the that's what the third member of the false trinity does. A apostate Christianity uh, uh, seeks to influence everybody, and the remnant church is not act, uh, 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 is exempt from that influence. We have to be very careful whom we worship because in the final crisis, the final crisis is only going to reveal something. It's going to reveal our character. Crisis doesn't create character. It reveals it. Like for right now, example right now, the coronavirus. Yeah, it's a crisis. It's a crisis. What is the coronavirus revealing of us? I pray that the coronavirus, that COVID is revealing one thing of us, that we need more of Jesus Christ that we need more of his wisdom, that we need more of his love. What is the coronavirus showing about who we are, the way that we treat other people, the way that we see, uh, uh, we think about other people? What is this coronavirus showing? If the coronavirus is showing bitterness in our hearts, if the coronavirus is showing uh, anger in our hearts, if the coronavirus is showing judgment, criticizing of our brothers or our people in this world, we have to really, really see that we have a need of Christ of Christ because crisis don't own the crisis don't create a character no uh crisis reveal our character what is this crisis revealing of us is this crisis making the church realize that we need to be about God's mission that we need to preach the gospel so that people can worship the true trinity and not fall pray to the false trinity how do we go about that, about sharing God's mission? Do we follow our own method in the way that we think, or do we follow Christ's method alone? What is this coronavirus showing us, this crisis? I hope that this crisis is showing us that we need more of Christ, we need more of the Holy Spirit, and that we need to be about God's mission. My friends, this whole world is leading to one central battle. 
And that's the Battle of Armageddon. And that battle is not a battle that takes place in Palestine, in the in the in the in the, in the uh, of Judea of the temple that supposedly will be rebuilt. No, my friends, this battle is the, the battle of Armageddon that takes place spiritually in every person's heart. And that battle is whom are you going to worship? My, my friends, we have a mission to do. One is so that we worship God in everything that we do and say and believe. But second, that we help others come to a true worship of God. What must we do? My friends, as we think about the sermon... There's two things that we must do. One, put God first in everything. Put God first in everything. My dear brethren, put God first in everything. Look at your life. Is God second in your life? Is there something in your life that is, be, that is taking God's place? My friends, put God first in everything. Second, study the Bible. Study the Bible. Because the Bible is our safe guard. The Bible is our, uh, our sure word of prophecy. The Bible reveals to us what we need to know so that we can act on the faith, have the faith of Jesus so that we can be ready. Because my friends, right now, this is, we feel, we feel that churches are being persecuted right now. <laughs> my friends, the Bible reveals to us a time where the church will be persecuted or church will be denied the free expression of worship of their creator we have to get ready now and the only way we get ready now is by studying the bible by letting the bible transform our characters remember the latter rain won't fall upon those who don't let the early rain change them if our characters are not transformed to the character of christ we need to study the bible because the jesus says sanctify them by your truth Thy word is truth. The only way that our characters can be changed is if we allow the Bible to change us. So my friends, that's what we must do. There's going to be a day when God's redeemed people from all ages, from the beginning of time, from Adam and Eve to the last child born in this world, will have the opportunity to fall before God at the white throne and all of us will fall on our knees and worship God. Why will we worship God? Because God is our creator and God is our savior. My friends, do you want to be together with all the redeemed of the world in that day to worship him who loved you and created you and redeemed you and saved you? Is it your desire to worship him from this day on? To let everything else be second to Christ because Christ is first? Do you want to worship God and resist the false trinity, the false worship of God? If your desire is to worship God with all your heart, to make Him first in your life, I invite you to have a word of prayer with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, here we are at your church. Just going over this sermon, Father, this Bible study on Revelation chapter 13, we really didn't go into depth. But we saw the central theme of Revelation 13 is that there are a, a there is an usurpation, there is a, a, a taking over of your prerogatives of you who are God, Lord. The false trinity, dra the dragon, Satan is trying to take away the worship of your people to Him, Lord. And Father, we know that you will prevail. We shall overcome. Father, the church will overcome, Lord, and we want to be those who overcome, Father, by the blood of the Lamb, Father. We want to be there at the white throne judgment, worshiping you, Father, because you, Father, has given us life, eternal life, Father, abundant life. Here are your children, Father, my brothers and sisters of the faith. Please guide us so that we can worship you, Father, in spirit and in truth, that we can resist Father, and get ready for the crisis that is to come upon this world because the crisis will only reveal whom we worship, Father, and we want to worship you. So please guide us and bless us according to your will in this holy and blessed Sabbath day. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, my friends, I hope you were blessed by this sermon. I hope the Lord blessed you and you saw that the important theme of chapter 13 of the book of Revelation is 
worship. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. My wife and my children send their greetings to you. May you have a wonderful and blessed Sabbath. Amen.